Okay, first of all, I would like to just give you a quick reminder. For lab number one, in your matrix class, this already mentioned twice in the Moodle, but let me just mention again in case you haven't done that. In the matrix class, remember this is equal feature inherited from any class, right? So do the following change. Is equal over here, you used to have uh, other of type matrix. And then it returns a Boolean. Okay, please do the following change. Could you please change the type over here? Rather than matrix, do it like, like, which is a keyword, current. Make sure you do this change. I already mentioned that in Moodle twice. Hopefully you have done that, okay? Just remind you. Otherwise, your class will not be compilable with my grading tests, especially for post conditions. Please make the change. Okay, the plan for today, I would like to finish uh, just a, a couple of points about test-driven developments. And especially to go over the flowchart with you, since now you know how to write the three kinds of uh, ES test, how to test for normal scenarios, how to test for precondition violation, and how to test for post-condition violation. Let's see how you should apply this test-driven development process for your software projects. I just wanted to give you a few more points to mention. And then we'll go to the example for using Deep Twin. Okay, we we'll just do one more example. Let's see how you can write complete post-condition. And then we'll go into design patterns, a few. Okay, we'll talk about iterator pattern specifically today, which will be covered in your lab number two, which will be released tomorrow. Okay, that's the plan. Okay, let's now talk about uh, test-driven development. So we talk about the difference between test case, and you can either test for normal or test for abnormal, where the contract violation is expected. Questions? You know what, let's talk after class, okay? Okay, so we got test case and we got test suite. So the difference is test suite is simply a collection of test cases, okay? So basically the idea is, you know, normally people say when you, do, when, you, when you are doing your reading, it is not so nice to have regression, which means you don't want to really read a, the, the same passage over and over again before you move on to the next one. However, in testing, regression is completely advised which means you have to maintain a suite of test cases. And whenever you introduce any, even the slightest change to your uh, software project, you should rerun the whole test suite and make sure everything is still passed. You still get a green bar. Okay, so this principle applies to any programming language you're trying to develop uh, project. Okay, regression testing, which I will go over in the diagram in just a moment. Okay, test suite. Okay, and then, so this is the point I mentioned last time. So you should really try to interleave the activity of writing test cases together with writing the code. So you really, you want to really write, start writing test cases even if you only get headers or signature of your methods. Start writing them as soon as your code is executable. And now I would like to emphasize the last point. Test, tests are really a precise executable form of documentation that tells you exactly what you should do for your software. And you will see that even more the case for lab number two. Remember for lab one, number one, before you actually uh, can implement the, uh, all the features, what did you do? You had to look at the example tests I gave to you to illustrate some simple behavior. For lab test two, uh, sorry, for lab number two, it's even more the case, especially when generic parameters is involved. So you really have to look into the test cases and see how things are supposed to be uh, used. And that'll be, simulating what you will be working uh, later. You will just be given test cases, you gotta work backwards to see how things should be implemented. Okay. So documentation, that's really an important functionality for writing test cases. Okay, so what I would like to do is finally, so you can go over uh, these, so we already cover. So another way to think about ES test, they're simply just a helpful clients. You just demonstrate the usages of your software, right? Okay, I would like to go over one flow chart with you quickly, and then we'll go into the uh, deep twist stuff. Okay. Okay, this is the flow chart I created for you. So let's just go over them very quickly. Let's just go over all the steps that are actually maintained. Uh, they should really follow. First of all, we start with basically some Eiffel classes and try to make this diagram not so Eiffel specific. It can be applying to your Java code, Python code, C-sharp, any software project you're building. 
So as soon as you start writing your software, think about what would be the earliest point you can already write a test case. As soon as you think you're ready, and go ahead and derive your test cases. And then once you get your test cases, depending on which unit testing framework it is supported for your programming language, write them, and then you can start running your test cases. Maybe initially when you only got headers or signature for your methods, things may not pass. That's okay. That means you just, you just have to go back to your development stage over here and add some implementation, okay? Another aspect about test-driven development is the test suite you have over here, it should be accumulative, which means you should really start adding more and more tests starting from day one of your software developments, okay? Keep adding tests until uh, maybe one day or even the last minutes uh, before you submit your projects, right? Just keep make sure you uh, keep adding test cases. And now this is so-called the uh, regression testing. Regression testing. Which means you just run them over and over again whenever you introduce any change. And I would like you to look at this self-loop over here. So, so what would be the possible scenarios for you to introduce a change? Typically, it's either because you want to extend with new functionalities or there's some bug report from your customer and you want to fix your uh, existing implementation. Or you decide that using a binary search tree is not so efficient, I would rather use a hash table. In that case, you have to change your implementation as well. In which case, once you have done with, with your changes, you shouldn't just commit your project to GitHub or to your internal repository right away. What you should do is, what should you do? Rerun all the test suite, okay? That's what you should do, and make sure everything's okay. So once you're done with all the extension and maintenance, make sure you rerun all the test cases and make sure you get a green bar. If you ever get any green bar, that means something's wrong something that's wrong that's introduced by your latest change and fix them before you continue. Okay, that's about a continuous process for test-driven developments that I will hope you will apply, okay? Any question about TDD before I go to a complete contract example? Okay, good, very nice. Okay, I would like to go over, so now we are done with TDD lecture, so what I would like to do now uh, we went over this slide here, especially we talk about how the old expressions are actually cached, right? Depending on how you bracket your expressions. For example, if you say old current versus old current twin versus old current deep twin, they mean different things. Things will be done automatically for you, but you have to know what the consequence is when you write the uh, old expression differently, okay? We have already done this slide, so I'm gonna just go over to the next one. So now we will be ready to consider another complete example. Let's talk about bank account, okay? I'll give you some background over here and then we'll see the different scenarios. Okay, so now let's just see some principle. When we talk about complete contracts, so what do we really mean? So we'll talk about old keyword, especially, so writing complete contract, let's say for deposit, if the only attribute that's involved is the balance, what, what does it really mean to be complete? You simply say balance equals old balance plus the amount. That's complete. However, things get much more complicated when you get composite structure attributes. For example, array, linked list, or tree. Let's say for the uh, case of the array, let's say I want to maybe, I have an array of accounts, let's say, and then I want to modify the account for Steve. And what should be the post condition to be complete? What does it really mean? Not only that, Steve's account should be properly changed as intended, but the rest of the bank, the accounts, should be unmodified. Okay, that's, that, that's what I mean for completeness. You wanna make sure no malicious supplier can actually create any faulty implementation that would be uh, simply satisfied by your post condition. Okay, that's kind of the idea. Okay, so now here's a rule of thumb whenever you got any composite structured uh, attributes. So you want to make sure the intended change is present. You only change the uh, Steve's account. That's the intended change. And the rest of the structure is unchanged. Okay, you want to make sure that. Actually, we did cover a little bit about this uh, for the uh, array of integer in the first few lectures. Okay, similar idea. The second one, the one I highlighted, is actually harder to specify than the first one. The first one is easy. If you want to modify at index i for this array, just go to index i and make sure its value in the post states is exactly what you want to change it to be. But the second one is a little bit more difficult 
because you have to use somehow the old expression. But how would you write the old expression in a way that will make sure you have no aliasing problem over here, right? We talk about shallow copy, reference copy, and deep copy. I can tell you the conclusion right away. Whenever you want to write uh, a contract like number two, deep copy is always the safest. However, sometimes it may be unnecessary, sometimes, because if the supplier is actually creating some reasonable implementation, then you don't really have to have so, so, uh, so much strong contracts. But I would say it's always safe to put, for number two, just deep twin. I can tell you the conclusion from today uh, for this topic. However, in the test or in the exam, I'll rather like to hear from your insight to see in this particular scenario, if I got a supplier's interpretation like this, it is wrong, but do I really have to use deep twin? Would shallow copy be sufficient? Okay, that's kind of the question I expect you to answer in the test or in the exam. Okay, so that's why we have to have a discussion like today's example, okay? Okay, so you gotta be worried about the reference aliasing and also iterable structure. Okay, that's kind of the thing we have to worry about. And we have used a lot of uh, across so far. So hopefully that part is not so bad. Let's go over the background for the example. We only talk about two classes. We have account and we also have bank, only two classes. For the account class, let's go piece by piece, very straightforward classes, but let's make sure we understand them before we talk about different versions of writing the contracts, especially post condition. Let's say we have a class called account. And for the account, we simply redefine the is equal feature. And then it has a constructor called make. And then let's say we have owner, we have balance. Okay, just these two attributes. Let's just make an integer just for simplicity. And then for the constructor, we simply assign you know, the, uh, the name and the balance accordingly. Initially, the balance is simply just zero, initially. And then let's say we, have, we only consider deposit in this case. Deposit has an amount over here. Let's not worry about the precondition for, uh, for the deposit, just for now, okay? And also, uh, post condition will be balance as equals O balance plus A. Okay, and what does it really mean for two accounts to be equal? That means the owners are equal and their balance are equal. Okay, very straightforward. Let's see the uh, bank class. So far, you can see for the account class, it's very easy to write complete contracts because there's no composite structures attributes, nothing. It's just simply a single string or a single integer. But now let's go to the second class. The second class is called bank, and we also have a constructor called make, but now the attributes are a little bit more complicated. So we have a, an attribute called accounts, which is simply an array of accounts. And then initially, account is simply just empty initially, okay? And then we have a query to say, given a string value over here for the name of the owner, we would like to find out what's the associated account objects, right? That's why you can see it returns account. Okay, so now require is gonna say, well, the name you pass better be an existing owner, okay? So this one should be quite easy for you. I'll just show you what it is. You simply use the sum so we have, we have seen very few examples so far for the sum, but this is exactly how you can use existential quantification. You would say there exists at least one account whose owner is the same as the name we are looking for. Okay, that's about a precondition. And then, uh, maybe you haven't seen that. Okay, I want to just show you one uh, logical rule that will be very important for you to look at. Okay, we know that for all, just x in general. If I say p of x, right, just any property. Can anyone tell me what would be the course, what would be the equivalent form if I want to use exists? Mm -hmm. How about this? Let me make one example. If I say all the students today pass 3311, how can I say using uh, ex existent existential quantification. There's no one student who actually fell, which means I gotta put a negation at the front and then put a negation on the property, right? Okay, let me write it down first and then we'll, I'll mention the example again. So that means there does not exist any member of X such that the property is violated. Agree? Okay, similarly, if I got something like that, there exists x that satisfy the property n is equivalent to 
it is not the case that every one of x <clears throat> agree? This one's a little bit e uh, interesting. How about this? Let me put it as the same example. There is, there is at least one student in 3311 who got A plus on the left-hand side, at least one. The left-hand side simply says, it is not the case that every student in the course who doesn't get, uh, and doesn't get A plus, which means somebody actually got A plus, right? If that makes sense to you? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll say that again, sorry. Let me make it a little bit clearer to you. Let's say this is a student. There exists a student in 3311, and P is simply, let's say, get A plus. Okay? It is equivalent to the following to say, every, for every student in 3311, how about this? Ignore, just temporarily ignore this, temporarily. What does this mean? That simply means, Every student in 3311 does not get A plus. And I want it to be just a negation of that, which means at least one who will get A plus. Questions? No, it's uh, just a mathematical, right? So I, I don't think brackets is going to uh, make any difference. So over here, basically, we simply, yeah, if you really want to put the brackets, you can put it like that, if that's what you meant. Like that? You cannot take out the, you cannot take out the negation. That's the proper, there's an axiom. So this is only uh, the logical axiom you learned from 1019. I just want to briefly review. Okay, now, the question is, how do we apply these two rules in contracts? So that's something I want to show you as an example. Okay. Let's go back here and look at this uh, contract over here. Across accounts as ACC, some, some account has the owner just the same as the end we are looking for. How do we rewrite it using across all? That's the question. So basically, logically speaking, we say, logically speaking, there exists one account whose owner is the same as the name. So how should we, how do we apply that rule? Basically, we're gonna say, it is not the case that every account in the bank does not have the owner name, okay? So think about this rule over here. So if you look at that, it's gonna be something like this, okay? You can see the not over here, and then I put a negation over here for the, uh, you know, the equality, okay? Any question about this precondition here, right? And nothing complicated, I'm just trying to say how you can rewrite the precondition if you prefer. Of course, I might ask you in the, uh, maybe in the test to say, is this contract over here using all over here, uh, using sum, is it equivalent to the one below, but I might take out the negation over here. So you should be able to tell why they are not equivalent. Okay, think about it. If you got trouble with the logic, come to speak to me, okay? Yeah. How about a logic? Mm -hmm. You mean like that? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. No, you cannot take out any negation. No, you cannot. Okay, just the axiom, right? Yeah. All right, good. Let's now go into the example over here. Okay, so now for the uh, account of, that's the uh, post condition. It simply says return value over here has the owner just the same as the one we're looking for. Okay, so now let's th think about also add. How do I add a new account? So now the precondition is the account owner should not exist already. So you can see that the precondition for here should be exactly the opposite, right, to what we just said. So I'll leave that to you to look at. Non-existing, okay, I'll leave you to read it over, okay? And then we also got 
some uh, uh, implementation over here. But I can assume the add and account of are simply correct. Okay, but we're going to use them in our contracts. That's my point. Okay, so far so good. What we will do is now we are going to do some illustration to you. I will try to also visualize what's going on. What I'm going to do is I will show you five different versions of the account class. Okay, of the bank class basically. Specifically, I'm going to show you how you can write a post condition for deposit on differently. What's deposit on? Deposit on basically take a name of an owner, for example, Steve, and then I want to deposit how much uh, money into uh, his account. Okay, that's deposit on. And this is a feature in the bank class. I'm going to show you five different versions over there, and then we'll compare to see why version one to version four are inappropriate based on the changes we would like to make. And version five, which use deep twin, will be satisfactory. So I'm just trying to show you why we always want to use deep twin if you want to be safe. Okay, basically that'll be the five version, but we'll just go over one by one, okay? So this, this is more like a summary table you can read over after uh, you have studied all the five version. Let's have a look, and you will see the idea. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, bank account we assume. Okay, let's say we have a bank object over here. Let me just point to you. We have a bank object over here, and the accounts array has only two elements. Let's say only two accounts at the moment. And B dot accounts at position zero, let's just say zero, but let's say we already rebased the array. Okay, by default it should be one, but let's say we already rebased. At position zero, let's say we have an account whose owner is uh, Bill. And then initially just zero balance. And accounts at position one, the second account has the owner, Steve, and then balance is zero. Okay, that's a very simple setup. So now we're gonna play with the post condition in the deposit on. Okay, let's see how we can do it. So now in the version number one, let's say we try to do some incomplete contracts, which means, uh, let, let's show and then we see why it is incomplete. So let's say we have, uh, the require is still the same as before. Uh, require simply means you want to make sure the, uh, uh, the owner exists, okay? And the implementation over here, we simply just do some loop over here. So from here to here, it's simply just correct. Just find out who the uh, owner is, the account, and then just uh, deposit onto it. Okay, so now let's, let's see the contract, and let's, let's see what's wrong with it. The first post condition is the number of accounts unchanged, which means if you used to get two accounts, it should be also two accounts afterwards, okay? The second, uh, the second one we have is account of, let's say Steve, the balance equals old account of Steve, the balance plus A. Okay? If we try to deposit into Steve's account, we want to make sure if Steve used to get zero dollars after depositing $100 into it, the resulting balance should be 100 for Steve, right? So do you have any, have any criticism for these uh, two post conditions? I would say for them individually, they worked, okay? They are necessary. But the problem is, are they really sufficient? Let's say, yeah, I should have put a, a precondition over there to say the uh, value should be positive. Let's assume that's the case. I should have put it, okay? Yes? So you're not checking if the other accounts are Uh-huh, right? Exactly, right? Because you can see that's exactly what we said about complete contracts. Over here, you can see we say nothing about, what about Bill, right? Remember the uh, diagram we just showed. Over here. Oh, actually, let me just show you the previous diagram here. That's the one. If you look at the previous diagram over here, if we want to deposit into Steve by $100, let's say we have done that properly. But the problem is, what if at the same time, we also try to deposit one million into Bill's account? In that case, it's not correct, but the, so far about the current post condition will be satisfied anyway, because they don't care about the rest of the accounts. So that is the reason why this first version over here, it is not complete. Agree? Okay, but we are lucky because at the moment you can see the uh, implementation over here only tries to deposit into that particular account. It doesn't try to do anything extra, so we are lucky. So if you try to run some test cases on this version number one, 
the implementation is correct, even though the uh, post condition is incomplete. We are lucky, but it's not going to happen always. Yes. Uh, you know what? We'll get there in uh, just a moment. How about this? A ask me the question again. Uh, okay. We will see that. Yeah. An array of accounts. Yes, correct. Correct. Okay. So for the front until loop, don't worry about it. Just assume it's correct. And you can read it uh, in details. Okay. Okay. First version there. That's it. And then we're going to have a test case over here. It's going to be the same test case throughout the five versions. Let's read only for the first time very quickly. Okay, let's say it's a normal case. So what we do is we simply create a new bank. We have two accounts, Bill and Steve. Exactly how we visualize, right? We visualize there. And if we call version one for Steve, we so deposit on version one, where the contract is incomplete, but the implementation is correct. Okay, and then afterwards, we simply want to make sure Bill's balance is zero. It, indeed, it is, because the implementation was correct. And then it should be 100 for Steve, right? It seems like everybody's happy, but just because we're lucky. Okay. Let's go to version two. For version number two, let's assume we already got a front until loop already. That's correct. Let's add something that will cause that to fail. No, let's add something that will make the implementation wrong. That's what I meant. Let's say we also go to, remember, um, let's see, let me show you one diagram over here. Okay, let's see over here. Version number one, version number two here. Okay, remember, we intend to only change the Steve account. However, we also go to the very first account and then do something about it. That's why you see the lower over there. Okay, so we'll do something extra. Okay, that's what we will do. Let's say you want to deposit into Steve, I will also deposit the same amount into your bill. Okay, that's wrong. So now, the same post condition over here. My question for you, is this okay? Well, let's, let's criticize about it. First of all, for me, by looking at that, we know that the new line in red will cause the entire implementation to be wrong, incorrect. However, does the post condition catch that? No. Apparently, as we said before, right? Because the post condition says nothing about uh, other accounts. That's a problem. Everybody agree? Okay, so this one shows you most likely you are unlucky. In this case, that your post condition is simply not good enough. So you gotta make sure your contract is just good enough. Okay, we agree with that. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the next version. Okay. Okay, the same test case, but now the problem is when you try to run this test case, what's gonna happen? The same test case. Well, apparently when you call B dot deposit on V2, Right? The post condition, because it is incomplete, so it is going to be happy about whatever that's being passed. But what's going to happen here? What, what happen, what's going to happen when we say result is assigned to this check? Is it going to fail or pass? That means when the client is trying to use this deposit on, they'll be very upset. Right? Because now they're going to see that Bill's account is not zero. It actually is changed incorrectly. Okay? That's what's going to happen for version number two. Okay, that's why you will see some check assertion violation over here. Okay, so far so good, right? For version one, version two. So now for version three, four, and five, what we're gonna do is, since we know we cannot just ignore what happens to the rest of the array, we have to do something about it, but now you gotta be careful. When you write the old expression, depending on how you write it, it's going to affect the way Eiffel caches the value for you in the pre-states. So that's why I want to show you this, okay? So now the same error is going to be there. We want to see which version, which copy is going to resolve the problem. That's what we're going to see, okay? Let's see for version number three. This is what I would suggest for version number three, okay? So you can see the same, the same loop and the same error over here, the same. And the same contract up to now, but now I'm going to have the following, others unchanged, okay? Let's have a look at the code and then I will visualize that for you. The following. Can you, let's read it together. We say across accounts, old accounts, as cursor, and then we say that 
is, so basically cursor is a cursor to account objects, right? We're iterating through all the cursor in the array. If the current uh, account we are looking at has the owner not equal to the, uh, the name we are looking for, then the account must be the same as the account as before. Okay? Everybody's okay with this? Okay, especially I want you to look at this, this uh, logic over here. We want to make sure we really understand this. Go over the old value for the accounts, and then we want to make sure we go across all the accounts and make sure if the account we're looking at, cursor item, has the owner that is not equal to the owner we want to deposit into. Okay, if that's the case, that implies something should be, uh, two expression must be equal. Okay, the left hand side will say that the current account we're looking at, which is the old one, must be the same as account of which is in the current states, right? So we're saying in the, old, uh, the pre states, in the post states, the two accounts must be the same. Okay, everybody happy with this? Okay. I can repeat again. Okay, how about that? Let me just be more precise about here. First of all, we are trying to go across the, we've, let's say what we, what we think, what you will do is, we're going across the old version of the accounts array before the deposit is done, old version. And then we're saying, when we say cursor the item, this should be the accounts in the pre-states. And the right hand side over here, when we say account of the implicit, this implicit current, right? When we say current, the account of, this is the account in the post states. So the same account in the pre state and the post state should be the same. That's what we're saying. Are we okay? Make sure you 100% understand this. Because it's, it's going to be basically almost the same for version 3, 4, and 5. The only difference is we're going to say copy like a twin and deep twin. But let's look at without any twin. Okay? Do you think this is going to work? Well, first of all, if you look at this old expression here, what value will be cached in the pre-states? What value? I heard reference copy of what? A reference copy of the accounts, right? Exactly. And that means when we talk about the accounts, and it's basically the same accounts objects, right? So now that means when we say cursor the item versus account of cursor the item the owner, we're talking about the same. Okay, let me just visualize for you quickly. So basically, let's look at the iPad over here and version number three. Okay, I want you to look at over here. So this is the this is the old accounts we have. Okay, let's let me, let me use green over here in the pre states. Okay, let's say this is exactly. Uh, let's say this is the layout over here before the feature execution. And now, how do we make a, let's say we have all accounts. It's going to be a reference copy of the accounts point to the same array over here. Agree? That's it. That's what the cache will do. And now, we have and also B accounts will be the post value. And old account will be the pre-stay value when we do this particular comparison. Right? Okay, what about the left-hand side? The left-hand side, when you say cursor the item, let's say we are currently looking at this particular item here. Cursor the item will be referring to this particular account. What about the right-hand side? Account of, which means we are using the current objects to call account of. In which case, it's also looking at this particular array. And which account has the name? Steve. What? Well, the same. So we are really talking about the same account. The same account is equal to itself. It's always true. So this post condition, although looking so complicated, it basically can be simplified to true. Okay? That's the remark I would like to make. Think about it. This is just equivalent to true. Just like that. Questions? Sure. Uh, the, the, the loop, the across. Can you rewrite it from the only way that says across from one to Can we rewrite it? It's possible. The question was, can I rewrite this across just a little bit so that it looks like a more like a from one until, right? Yeah. Let me try over here. Basically, it looks something like this. 
across one until old accounts dot count as let me say index i how about that okay and then i will say all over here and then here i will simply say old accounts add position i dot item tell that and this part is simply the same but i'll just repeat it Uh, count off and then I'll put over here a count of uh, owner the owner is simply in like that you know what make sense okay that's simply just a rewrite but these two are just equivalents okay okay any question about this yes Oh, yes, good question. Uh, that's a good concern. Yeah, okay. Apparently, we should start with zero and over here, minus one. I agree. Okay, anyway, so these two are equivalent. And we know that reference copy is not good enough. So now, what will be the next one to try? The next version. Shallow copy. Okay, so now we want to uh, change just a little bit about the post condition. Go to version number four. Yes, question. So you want you, so you're saying that you're gonna change rather than the balance, you wanna change the owner. No, it's the same thing. I just wanna make sure that at the moment when you're checking mm -hmm. the balance is mm -hmm. changed or not. So would it give false at that? Okay, yeah. Good question. So now let's do it again. Shall we? Okay. Again, we we agree that this is the value that will be cached in the pre states, right? And now we got two copies over here. And now remember in the body of the execution. Not only that, it's good, I forgot to illustrate that. Not only that, we're going to deposit 100 into Steve. But at the same time, we're going to deposit also 100 into Bill. So this part is really the wrong part. right? But you can see that since the array for the pre-state value and the post-state value, basically they're the same array. So that means the account object over here is really the same. So you cannot tell the difference. Those are, so this is the wrong implementation because you can see over here, we mistakenly assign Bill's balance to be 100. Bill should remain the same, but he did not remain the same. If you got correct implementation, it will still give you true. But the true is too optimistic, right? Okay. Uh, it's, it's no, it's not false. Okay, first of all, can you, uh, let me see this. First of all, you can see that because we write simply just all accounts, right? That means in the pre-states, we're going to cache a variable, let's call it all accounts, right? It's simply just going to be a reference copy to the accounts array. Agree? Not, so that means we're only making a reference copy, right? And remember, in this particular implementation, we actually got some incorrect line over here, right? So that means not only that we, we only intend to change Steve's balance to be 100, but it will also change the first account, which is Bill, to be also 100. And this is unintended. Agree? And now, when we actually compare these uh, B the accounts and also the O accounts, we, when we com combine them, uh, compare them together, we cannot really tell the difference because they're referring to the same array. In this case, old, even though it's old, but it's only the old reference copy. So it's not ex expressive enough for you, okay? Exactly, it's just the same as, okay? So now you can see that it's just insufficient. That's why we gotta move on to the next version and try. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. No, there's no result over here because, uh, what, what do you mean the result? This is a command, right? 
So this is only a command. So there's no re uh, return value here. So you don't have you don't have any result. You only put a result when the feature returns something. On the left side, what do you mean on the? You mean here? Here? Where? Well, it's a result, but there's no result keyword here. You only have the result if the feature returns some value, but it's not the case, so you don't have a result. Okay. Yeah? Okay, let's go to version number four. Let's see how the version number four will look like. Version number four is going to look like something like this. Something like this. We simply change from old accounts to old accounts twin. Would it actually help for this kind of change? Would it help? Well, let's see how the value will be cached in this case, okay? So here we got old accounts. Let's see exactly what's gonna happen, okay? So let's see over here. So we got old accounts dot twin over here. So what we will say, what we will have is, let's say old accounts, let's say twin. Are we gonna create a new array? We will, right? Well, first level copy, remember? So then what you will do is create a new array of size two. But what after that? Same reference, exactly. So that means zero to here and one to here, like that. That's the uh, shallow copy. You can easily see, does it help? No, because uh, even though I want to modify Steve only, at the same time, I also want to, mo well, I also mistakenly modify Bill to be 100. But now I cannot tell the difference anymore, right? That's pretty much similar to the array copy example we show in the class before, right? So this one doesn't help. Questions? Is integer not a reference type? What do you mean integer not a reference type? Where? Like it's, it's not considered like a primitive. Uh, so if you modify the integer. No, because uh, remember over here we simply say, not only we, we simply say we also deposit into this particular account, right? So we just change the value to be another one, right? It shouldn't be changed. Okay, finally, final version, okay? Final version is, what about we do this? Old accounts dot deep twin. Let's see what's gonna happen exactly, okay? Again, let's visualize what's gonna happen here. Version five. So here we say old accounts dot deep twin over here, okay? So let's say old accounts deep twin is a variable here. And should we create a new array? Yes, I agree. Same as the shallow copy. Two elements. Now, what's gonna happen? Should we just create references? We should recursively create the objects, exactly. What we should do is, let me just put it very precise over here. We got one account over here, accounts, Another account object over here, ACC, and then the owner, owner here is Bill, the first one, and the owner for the second one is Steve. And initially, the balance is simply zero for both. Okay, that's the old version. And now let's see how the incorrect implementation is gonna affect anything. So what it will do is, it's going to go for the current copy over here. Not only that it's going to modify Steve into 100, but also it's going to modify Bill into 100, right? So now when we compare these two arrays, we're gonna see this account over here is not equal to this account here. That's how we catch the error. Okay, question. Yeah, so where you circle the old accounts, the yeah. if you had brackets around old and accounts and the deep twin was outside the brackets. Oh, good question. The question was, what if I got exactly uh, like, like this line here? What if I write something like this? You mean old accounts? It's a very good question. Old accounts dot. Okay, it's a very good question. I can tell you, well, anybody want to try? The question is, is the one I write over there, old accounts in brackets dot deep twin. Is it the same as all accounts dot deep twin? Are they the same? Yes. Okay, if you don't think they are the same, can anybody tell me why they are different? It's like, it's like the calculator, like when you do brackets. Well, 
But I agree. So, so that means which, so first of all, the old, what, what would be the expression that's going to be cached? Accounts, right? Which means we'll make a reference copy of that, and then after the whole change, we're gonna make a deep twin. Uh, let me show you exactly what's gonna happen. It's a very good question, I like it. So that means, let's say hypothetically, how, what's gonna happen for this case over here? So O account is going to be caching the pre-states. O accounts is going to be a reference copy of the array, agree? And then the deep twin will only be evaluated in the post states when you check the post condition, which means we will copy the whole thing and make a deep twin. It's not gonna help, which is wasting more memory, okay? But it's a very good question, I like it. So guys, please make sure you understand the difference between these two. Do you want me to repeat? Okay, I'll repeat again, okay? So now basically, again, let me just say that again. Uh, we are comparing this expression over here, old accounts deep twin, no brackets, versus put the brackets around old accounts and then say deep twin. We know very well how this is going to behave, right? So let's talk about this one over here. This one over here is going to say old accounts will be cached. It doesn't include deep twin which means this is more like a reference copy back in version number three. Just do a reference copy here, so old accounts is going to be a reference copy of the accounts array, right, in the pre-states. And then when we evaluate this particular expression in the post condition, it's only going to do the deep twin then. Okay, that's not doing the right thing. We should do the, we should do the deep twin in the pre-state, not in the post-states. Exactly, it's a deep twin after the implementation, exactly, okay? So it's really, it re definitely requires some insight into how things are cached. Okay guys, any questions? Yes. I have a question about the order of operations when you actually, when a client calls this method. Okay. So what happens when the client calls, for example, let's say the client calls this department method. Okay. So does the post condition, is the post condition the first thing that runs? The post condition, oh, the order, okay. Uh, I would say the order goes like this, conceptually. It may not be exactly what happened, but just conceptually. First of all, the precondition will be checked. After the precondition is checked, we know that we should really go into the implementation. But before that, we'll look at the post condition to find out all the old values that should be cached. Cache them, and then implement, execute the implementation, and then do the post condition. So the post condition doesn't count, only the old part. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not, not the whole thing. You don't have to, you don't have to evaluate the post condition in the pre-state. You only cache what's necessary for you to evaluate the post states. Okay, all right, I hope that's clear. Okay, if no further question, we finish this lecture here, but I want to have you some, do some exercise by yourself. And feel free to ask me to discuss with you what you think the answer is. Or I can ask your opinion in the midterm, okay? Either way. Okay, I would like you to think about these uh, different ways of writing post condition over here. Think about them and why each one of them will be, uh, why the on, only the last one is actually correct. Think about them, okay? We do have time. I would think about, I'm thinking about me to hold a review session for you guys during the reading week to prepare your midterm. Uh, would that help? Yeah. During the read, okay. I will, I'll let you know the time, possibly Thursday or Friday, but I'll confirm with you, okay? okay? So we can talk about anything. Would you be able to record that? Me to record, yeah, I will I'll record that, yeah. Uh, you know what, what I would do is, because everybody might have different schedule during the reading week, I'll do some survey on Moodle and see if you want to attend, which time works better for you, okay? Yeah, I will talk about it, don't worry, we still have time. Okay, so that's about writing post condition. Now I would like to go to a new lecture here. I only got about maybe 30 minutes or so, I guess, okay? Let's talk about iterator pattern. But before I do that, I can tell you that lab number two, I already got a sample solution, so I pretty much know how, how it is going to work. Lab number two will really force you to understand how to use generic parameter in a, in a way, in some way, I, I de de uh, how to say, I delegate a job to the compiler. The compiler will actually tell you if you write something that doesn't make type sense, they will tell you there's a type error, okay? That's something you gotta struggle through for lab number two, but I'm sure you'll gain a lot, okay? Now, let me just prepare you a little bit for that. Let me just for generics. 
for today, I will only cover very quickly about just how to use gener generics. What's the very intuition behind generics? And then once we talk about inheritance, I'll tell you the deeper insight into why generics can be helpful. Uh, it's going to be due temp uh, temporarily, uh, tentatively, maybe next Friday at midnight, something like that. Or uh, we'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's now look at some example here. Now I want you to look at stack, which you are all familiar with from 2030 or from 2011. Yes. Oh, that one there. There is a slide. You know what? Let me send this as a Moodle announcement. I think this is a slide I created. I'll refer you to that particular slide, and then you will see. How about that? Okay. Questions? You mean for lab number two? Yeah. No, you got something completely different. Yes. Oh, you mean how you can write the post condition? You want me to write it now, or? Oh, you're just saying, oh, what, what do you mean? The one who frames someone in the Moodle. Uh -huh. Could you make that one similar to the two that has? Uh, not exactly. Is it different? Uh, I, would say, I would say once you see that particular post condition, you will find some inspiration for writing your lab. How about that? Not exactly the same, but you will see some uh, similarity there. OK. Uh, send me an email to remind me. OK, please. OK, let's have a look at very quickly. Let's say we have a stack of strings. Let's have a quick look of the code very quickly. Let's say I have implementation array of string and some counter for the stack. We pretty much know how to implement a stack using array, so I wouldn't bother you with the implementation in detail. OK, so we got a count, the size of the stack. Also, what's the top of the stack being a string? So pay attention to what I highlight in uh, yellow, the type. Push, I want to push a string into the stack. I want to pop, in which case it's just a command, just pop it off. That's a stack. OK, easy. Stack of strings. Now, I have a question for you. So here, if you look at the uh, stack or any collection type, so you can see that the features we support over here is really about the storage and retrieval of elements, right? Does it really depend on how the string elements are going to work? For example, it doesn't really say anything about how you should really append to the top how you should really uh, do something about the uh, whatever you pop off, right? It's only about the FIVO property we are implementing, right? That's point number one. So it's really about a retrieval and storage for the uh, FIVO stack. Nothing to do with the string, which means now today if I give you another assignment, how would you do another class, a count of, sorry, a stack of accounts? No, just a stack of accounts. If I say, this code I give to you, and do you think you have to make many changes to make a stack of accounts? What would you have to change? Exactly what I highlighted, right? You just change. You can do a string replace, find a, uh, find a replace, replace every occurrence of string by account. There you go. You got the account, uh, stack of account. If I want to get a stack of matrix, replace string by matrix. Do you see that? So what's the problem for this? It makes the code not reusable. That makes the code, ah, uh, correct. That makes the code not reusable because every time if you want to create a new kind of stack, you have to copy and paste and then just replace a uh, string by some element type. Okay, anything else? Oh, no. You have to like, you know, look for each and every occurrence of string to find a new place even the new parameter. If you want to build your new stack. Yes, correct. Yes. Type hmm? mismatch errors. Say, say it again. Type mismatch errors. Type mismatch error. Uh, in this case, no. You can just replace string by account, any type, as long as they're consistent. That's how you create a new class. OK? OK, apparently you're right. So the problem is we are not really reusing the code. We're duplicating lots of code. And that's exactly how you create a uh, state of account over here. Again. It does, it, we only talk about FIFO property, retrieval and storage. Nothing to do with how you deposit or withdraw from the account. Nothing to do with it. Okay? Okay, so now this is really the uh, observation here. So now 
we say that your design smells if you got lots of uh, duplicates, right? We want to avoid that, okay? Generic parameter is a good solution to it. So today, I just want to show you from a code reuse point of view how to understand generics. But later on, once we talk about inheritance, polymorphism, we will understand from a different perspective. That's what we will do after, uh, maybe next week, hopefully. Okay, so now this is how you declare the stack. Okay, let's go over that and then I'll show you exactly how you can use it. Okay, so this, so now you want to somehow factor out all the duplicates. Let me show you this. Let me show you the iPad over here. So now I put the uh, stack of strings and stack of account side by side over here. Side by side. And we can see the string over here and the accounts over here. These are the only thing that are different. What we will do is we're going to factor them out, make it a parameter to the class. What do I mean? What I will do instead is like this. So over here, what I will do instead is to say, uh, let me use a different color. I will say stack over here, just make a general name rather than stack string or stack account. And then I'm going to declare a parameter for the class called G. It can be any name as long as the name does not clash with any existing class like in Java. So now what I mean, what I can do is I can replace every occurrence of string over here by just G. So this will be the only class I need from the supplier side to provide a stack. So that means if the client wants to instantiate this class into a stack of accounts, what should they do? They only have to say, I want a stack where the parameter G should be instantiated by account. Okay. That's exactly how the client is going to write this. Okay, for the supplier, it looks like this. Let me just show you for, uh, once more. That's how the code should look like from the supplier side. We have a parameter called G, and the number of parameters you can have for the class is unlimited, depending on how many you need. For lab number two, you got three to worry about. Okay, just to give you a little bit uh, preview. Okay, so now the G can be anything, and as long as it does not clash with any class name. And now I want you to look at very quickly again, the iPad over here. So now let's say this is the supplier side, we got stack of G. And now, what about the clients? If the clients, let's say client number one, they want to have a stack of string. All they have to do is to declare to say stack and then G will be instantiated by just a string. That's what they do. That means, under the hood, this particular copy of the generic stack will be reused to make a new stack class under the hood, right? We're gonna replace every occurrence of G by just a string. That's exactly what we saw in the beginning for a stack of string. So while we're just reu reusing the same block of code, for the generic stack. Let's see a second example. Let's say we have a second client who actually want a stack of accounts. In this case, we do not duplicate the code anymore. All we gotta do is, we can simply just make a, another copy of this class over here. All we gotta do is change every occurrence of G by accounts. Account over here, accounts, and accounts. That's all we do, okay? That's just a very quick intuition about how you can use generic classes. Any questions about this? Okay. If you're okay with this, that's about generics. I'll cover more details from the typing perspective for inheritance a little bit later. Okay, you can go over the slides, nothing new. I already illustrated this in the iPad. Okay, so now let's have some practice over here, okay? Let's say this. Let's say we have a test cases Let's say SS is a stack of string, SA is a stack of accounts. Let's say we have string, we have accounts, and now, does this compile or not? It does, right? Because you can see that A in quotes is a string, and string is consistent with the element type for SS. So this one compiles, okay? What about this line over here? SS.push, 
And this line over here, I'm simply making a an anonymous object of type account. No, 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 no. no. It was, it's not going to compile because SS is expecting a string elements as we declare over here. It should be a string, right? But you're passing an account. That's not good. Okay, so it's not going to compile. What about this line here? When you say s, which is a string value, is assigned to whatever ss.top will return. That will be okay, because uh, it will be a string. And on the other hand, when you say a, which is a count, will be assigned to the top of ss. That should be compilation error. Okay, you get an idea. Okay? And similar idea, you can follow through for the rest. Okay, any question about this example here? Yes? You have to, apparently, I didn't do it. Of course, you got to do it. Yeah, I just omit too much code over here, but I just want to show you the idea. Okay, let's now go on to sound design. Okay, let me just define what design patterns mean. And then uh, in this course, we're going to cover about five or six design patterns at least, the common ones. So let's just say what the design patterns are. And the first one we will talk about is called iterator, which is what your lab number two is about. So basically, design patterns, they are solutions to recurring problems, which means these problems occur, are very common. They occur uh, once and uh, over and over again in the software industry. And people actually design some solution for, the, for that particular problem. It'll be very easy for you, to, if you follow the structure for the design pattern, it's easy, uh, be very convenient for you to extend or maintain your code onwards. Okay, but now you can see within a particular context, which means it doesn't mean a single design pattern will fit for all the problems. You have to understand exactly the context to apply that particular pattern. Okay, but for the iterator, we're gonna see. Okay, so they are just uh, architectural heuristics for you to apply depending on what the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, of course, we're gonna, for each, each design pattern, we're gonna learn about pros and cons. Okay, iterator pattern. Let's now have some quick discussion, and then I will show you exactly how, do, how you can do it, okay? And today I'm gonna program on iPad by hands, okay? Hope, I'm trying this strategy for today to, for teaching. Hopefully that will work, okay? We'll see. Okay, iterator pattern. Let's see the motivation. Let's have a look at this code here. We have a class called shopping cart, just cart. And then each shopping cart has an uh, orders and feature over here has no none, that means it's public. And then orders is an array of order. Let's assume we have an order class, let's assume. And oh, actually we do have it, we don't have to assume. Class order here and then we got price and quantity. Okay, just say they're integers. I want you to look at another client class for the cart. So we have a shop class and then cart is simply cart and then we have a checkout feature in the clients, which depends on the orders. Because the orders is public, so we can just go directly to access the orders. So we simply do a front until loop using the lower and upper for the array. That's the most efficient way for you to write it. And then you can say result is assigned to result plus whatever price is multiplied quantity. Very straightforward, okay? Now, do you see any potential problem? Especially from the maintenance point of view. What, okay, when you say there's no encapsulation, what, give me a scenario where things will go wrong. Uh, Order is public, public yeah. so what's wrong with that? You can access it in such a way to screw up. Let's say the client, they, they wouldn't screw up the order's contents. Let, I'm more thinking about, let me give you a little bit hints to what, what I want you to get to. Is there any possible change on the supplier side that is going to upset the clients. Uh, currently, the client's code on the right-hand side, they depend on very much about the array, right? You can see lower, upper, and also loop counter, right? Very much depend on that because it's efficient to write. Now, can you imagine any change to the supplier side that will upset the cl clients? Yeah, exactly. Let's say, for example, if today I decide I want to change in the supplier side from array implementation into a linked list implementation, will the client code 
which used to compile, still compile? No. What's wrong? Give me a line that wouldn't compile. Well, lower or upper, right? Exact, uh, for example, they, they just wouldn't compile. But in general, if you try to change from one implementation to another, if you didn't uh, really hide your implementation attribute over here, client's code may just uh, stop to compile. That's the point, okay? Maybe I understood this uh, from the previous course already. But this, uh, this actually violates a design principle called information hiding. So what's really information hiding? I got definition in the next slide, but just let me repeat it verbally. Orders over here is basically some design decision. I decide to actually use array to implement my cart at the moment. But it's kind of subject to change. It's kind of unstable. So any unstable design decision which might be subject to change must be hidden from the clients. So that means whenever I change it later, since it's hidden, it's not going to affect the clients the way they use the code. That's the intuition. And iterator pattern is exactly for this kind of purpose. To say, if you want, well, let's see what, what, the client, what, do, what does the client, client really want. They simply just want to go over the orders one by one. The iterator patterns tells you that, well, don't, don't worry about if the under, under the hood, the implementation is either an array, a linked list, or a binary search tree, it doesn't matter. What I will do for you is, I'm gonna go give to you the item one by one. And you are already using the iterator pattern so far a lot. What's that? The across loop. Remember the way you use the across for linked list or the array? Basically the same. Across the array, and then I will give you the elements one by one. Across the linked list, it will also give you one by one. You are more like a client for the across, uh, for the iterator pattern so far. And today, you're gonna become the supplier. For lab number two, yay, good. <laughs> I'm gonna see exactly how you do it, okay? Okay, let me uh, explain to you how the architecture for the iterator pattern works, and then I will show you how you can implement that quickly. My experience is, you don't expect to really learn uh, everything about iterator pattern just in the lecture. I'll try to give you as much information as possible, refer to them when you do your lab two. But most importantly, try to start a lab number two as soon as possible. Okay, I'll give you most of the ideas today. If not, definitely on Thursday for sure. Okay, let's now look at the architectural diagram for iter iterator. I'll go there. And we'll also at, uh, show you how you can read the bound diagram. Is that even readable? <coughs> Better? Okay, how about that? Basically, let's look at the client side for the iterator pattern. Okay, let's now, let me just explain bit by bit. We have some client application for the iterator pattern. And how do we know it's a client? Basically, you can see that there's a client supplier relationship over here. Okay, that's the uh, double line arrow. That's client supplier relationship, relationship. And the reason we say that it's a client is because over here, I want you to look at, this is something you have to do for lab number two, something called iterable. Whenever you see an attribute called iterable, that means you're using the iterator pattern. So that means iterable can be instantiated at the runtime by into array or into some other data structure. It doesn't matter. From the supplier side, they will only tell you it's an iterable. So all you gotta do is, you just iterate through it using a cross. Okay, and then let's go on. And then the way you use it, I will read, uh, I'll leave that to you for to reading the client's code. Uh, you can use the across over here. You can also use the across, okay? That's something uh, you are familiar with already. Let's look at the supplier side, which is new to you. How do you implement the iterator pattern, okay? So now let me just draw your class into context. Let's say over here, if you're trying to declare, let's say this is your class, let's say my class, Step number one, you have to make sure you inherit from this deferred. So in IFO, when you say defer, it simply means abstract in Java. When I say a deferred class, it means abstract class, okay? In a deferred class called iterable, there is only a single feature you have to implement called new cursor, okay? As soon as I say my class inherits from iterable, I and obliged to really implement this new cursor uh, objects, a new cursor feature. 
It's like a query. And now let's, let's look at what's the type for this feature here. You can see the type over here is, let me use a different color here, it's called iteration cursor. It's like an iterator. You can see iteration cursor is exactly over here. Right? That's why you also have a client supplier relationship over here. Because you can see again, let me repeat, for iterable, it is a client for iteration cursor simply because, sorry, uh, that's screwed up. Okay, iterable is a client for iteration cursor for this for the following reason. For one of the features in iterable called new cursor, it is making use of a type called iteration cursor. That is why iteration cursor is a supplier, right? Whenever you're using a, re a return type, the return types class is also your supplier. Okay, so far so good. And for the client supplier relationship, you also have to put the feature name over here to show. Because new cursor has a return type, iteration cursor. That's why you put a new uh, cursor over here. And if you want to do, uh, implement this new cursor feature, what do you have to implement? There are three things you have to implement. One is called after, the other one item, and the third one fourth. And this should also seem familiar to you, right? How you use the linked list, like a cursor operation. Okay. One more detail before I show you two cases of implementing the iteration cursor. Uh, there's something you want to note. There are certain classes in IFO that's already iterable for you to use. So you, sh you should really try to use them whenever necessary. For example, all the collection classes, array, linked list, and array list, they are all iterable. You can see over here, they all implement or uh, inherit from the iterable class. So what does that mean? That means they all support a new cursor feature. So now, if your internal structure is only using an array, how do you support your, let's say this. I'll show you a simple case. If my class over here is only have A of type array of certain, let's say string, make it easy. How can I make my, my class iterable? I inherit from iterable, but now how do I implement the new cursor feature? I can say, just return a dot new cursor, because a of type array is already supporting the new cursor feature for you. You get it for free. That's an easy case. The hard case, for example, what if I have two arrays in my class, a and b, I have array over here, let's say integer. There is no such a collection class which has two arrays, which means you have to implement a new cursor yourself. In that case, you have to go back to this hierarchy over here and then create a subclass yourself over here, maybe call that my iteration cursor. That's why you have to implement. That's a hard case, architecturally. Yes? Say it again. To the array, I believe to the array is also iterable. Yeah, to the array. So you know, uh, do an experiment for me. Go to the to the array class in Eiffel Studio on the feature box. Type new cursor. I think it will be uh, searchable. You should be there. Okay, you should be there. Yeah, to the array should be uh, iterable. Yes, all the collection classes. Okay, that's about the architecture. Okay, let me show you in just ten minutes how you can program the two cases, and then we are done for today. And then once you struggle through. Lab number two, a little bit tomorrow. Hopefully we can have more discussion on Thursday. Okay, give me just about five or seven minutes, okay? Okay, easy case. Let's say easy case, very easy, okay? Let's see over here, how do I program this? Let's say I already got a class called card, and then I have orders, which is hidden over here. Now, how do I make sure my card class is iterable? Step number one inherits iterable and the most critical part over here is to make sure you instantiate the gener generic parameter over here so you will got lots of practice on this on lab number two I will give you the general advice there's only one single value should be instantiated over here typically you got to think about if I want to return one element at a time for the card, what should be the type of element I should return? In this case, it's easy. 
just return one order object at a time. So I will simply put order here. Okay, that's a simple case. And then once we have done this, we will be required to implement a new feature, right? The new cursor feature. So what we got to do is let's say feature, and then so this is a cur uh, the iterable feature. Okay, what we should do is we're gonna say new cursor, which returns. I uh, let me remind you, a iteration cursor, which is also generic. Okay, what should I do? So I'll just write it out, iteration cursor. And now I have to also instantiate the type for the iteration cursor. You can just make it the same as this type over here, just order. Which means whenever I want to return an iterator for my cut class, it's going to give me one order at a time. Okay? And now let's see what the implementation should be. Do and end. Since I say it's a simple case, one line implementation. So now, how should we get a new cursor in this case? Well, orders is of type array. Array is a collection class. Every collection class in IFO already is iterable, which means they support a new cursor and you can get it for free. So all you can do is a one line implementation. You can say a result is assigned to orders dot new cursor as easy as that if you only got simple attribute like this which already support the new cursor just call that you get it for free unfortunately that's not what you will be doing for lab number two unfortunately okay let's see what you should do for lab number two okay conceptually so that's why i really want to go over this okay give me about four minutes and that will be done Four or five minutes. Any question about this? I tell you what, basically the second hardest solution is not so hard. Basically you have to make sure you can create a cursor, iteration cursor class yourself, like in the diagram. You have to create a class by yourself and then you can uh, return an instance of that. Okay, I will show you. Harder case. Let's say we have a class called book. Okay, and then we have two attributes, names and records. There's no such a library class which has two arrays. So you gotta implement that by yourself. Let's do it bit by bit. Step number one, we should inherit from iterable. Inherit iterable. Now, here comes the most confusing part. If you simply hypothetically if you simply put string and then g, for example, right? You put two values over here, it wouldn't compile. That's the most common error. I'll tell you why. Because you can see the iterable is basically iterable of g. It only takes one particular value for instantiation. So you have to give only one. I can tell this is really the most common error. Please learn from this. Before you uh, say anything, let me just finish this and then we'll get to your question. So this is absolutely wrong. Okay, you don't want that. So how can we fix this? One way to fix it would be we can simply have a class over here. For example, iPhone has a class called tuple. Let me put it here. You can say tuple over here. And then I want to say every time, so now here's the thing. Every time I get one element from the book, I want it to be a tuple consisting of the name and the record. So what I would put, what I would put is tuple, and then I'll put string here, and the name, and also g, over here. Okay, like that. You will see some little bit tutorial example in the lab, in, uh, lab two instructions. Let me do one more thing. Okay, one more thing. You're gonna say feature over here, and then you will say new cursor. And now it's gonna be iteration cursor. And then for iteration cursor, you're gonna put exactly this tuple thing over here, right? It's a single value. So now, what about the body over here? Okay, I'll show you the slide quickly and then we're done. What you gotta do is, you have to create a separate class like shown in the diagram over here, which will inherit from the iteration cursor and implements the after item and fourth feature. Let's see that very quickly and then we're done. 
Okay, the harder case is over here. Okay, what you gotta do, new cursor, iteration cursor, and we put tuple here, right? And now, we simply create a new cursor a class called my iteration cursor. I'll show you how it looks like. Okay, it will simply take some generic parameter, and then we'll say we'll say that we create an instance of this particular one and assign that as a return value. Okay, now the question is, how do you implement this iteration cursor by yourself? Next slides quickly. So you would say my iteration cursor inherits from the iteration cursor, and then I'm saying each element there is simply going to be a tuple of string and g. Okay, and now you just have to implement somehow the item after and forth these three features. I gave you a little bit of hints on the slides. One way to implement them is simply use a integer counter to know where the cursor position is. And every time when you call the item over here, you can simply return whatever the cursor position corresponds to as the elements. Okay, any questions before I let you go? Okay, I'll stop here and then we'll talk more about iterator on Thursday.